Welcome to the first edition of Vienna Showcase from the Kunsthistorisches Museum Vienna. Today I am pleased to welcome representatives from media and the travel industry from 16 countries, from the US to India. So a warm good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Vienna Showcase is our brand new live stream series to present Vienna as the lively arts and culture city that it is, even during this extraordinary and difficult year. For many of you, it may not be possible or may be relatively difficult to come to Vienna at the moment for research, business or just enjoy the most livable city in the world. So in the meantime, we bring Vienna and its world-famous cultural scene to you with Vienna Showcase. We all hope that this situation will change soon and international travel will be part of our lives again, without any obstacles. Just keep in mind, Vienna will still be the most beautiful city in the world after the coronavirus crisis. Welcome to the Kunsthistorisches Museum. The Kunsthistorisches Museum is the top museum in Vienna. It houses the former imperial collections from Greek and Roman, Egyptian art, the paintings, the Kunstkammer, and uh, of course it's something what we call a Gesamtkunstwerk. We have just put on our show Beethoven Moves, honoring this great composer on his 250th birthday this year. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the show, show and, and stay, stay safe. safe. A very warm welcome to all of you following us from India to the US West Coast and Canada. I was told you even have a public screening there, so good morning and a special shout out to you guys. It really feels great being in touch with you. All of you again are partners from media and the travel industry. Well, we thought if you cannot come to see what Vienna has to offer, we have to find another way. So we decided to start broadcasting. And here we are. This is the first episode of a new series, Vienna Showcase, today live from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. I am standing here with Jasper Sharp, who is a chunk curator for modern and contemporary art here at the museum. And Jasper is also one of the co-curators of the exhibition we're about to see. Now we're all very eager to see the show, but before that, just a little bit of housekeeping because we want to hear your thoughts and your questions. And you have two ways of submitting your questions. Either you post them right into the chat next to the YouTube screen, but please make sure you're logged in into your account. Or you can also send us emails to showcase at Vienna Dot info and we'll have these email address inserted during the show. Now Jasper, over to you and to all of you following us from around the world. We should very exciting 30 minutes and we catch up at the end of the show again for taking your questions. Jasper, the stage is yours. Thank you, Nicky. Good afternoon from the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Um, to present an exhibition about Ludwig van Beethoven is uh, a particularly delicate uh, task. He's of course an extraordinary figure, one of the most famous people who ever lived. A lot of people know a bit about Beethoven and a few people, especially in this town, know an awful lot. So we had to approach this project with, with caution, but not too much caution. Beethoven was not a cautious individual himself. He was radical and risk-taking. And so we attempted to channel a little bit of this radicality and risk-taking in the exhibition ourselves. What you will not find here uh, are any paintings of Beethoven. We're not attempting to tell the biography of his life. Uh, fortunately, in Bonn, the city in Germany where he was born, they mounted an exhibition earlier this year which did exactly that. So this freed us up to be a little more experimental, a little more intuitive, shall we say. And what we've put together is an exhibition in four parts, almost like the four movements of a symphony, very different architectural tableaus, which seen as a whole, thread together this remarkable life and legacy. And if you join me now for a few minutes, I'll walk you through the galleries and show you some of the remarkable objects that we've put together. We're gonna begin over here. On the wall of this gallery, the first gallery, which is dedicated to the young Beethoven, 
his arrival in Vienna at the age of 22, uh, this young genius, we have all 32 of the piano sonatas, which were entirely composed here in Vienna uh, during the course of his life. And these drawings have been made by a young German artist, Jochen de Voigt. She has analyzed each of the sonatas in turn and created her own emotional response to these works, attempting to render in physical terms the music of Beethoven, which of course is entirely abstract. And in certain moments, we've been able to compare and contrast Jorinda's renderings of these wonderful pieces of music with the original scores in Beethoven's own hand. Uh, this is the Waldstein Sonata, borrowed from the Beethoven House in Bonn, dedicated to his first patron, Count Waldstein, uh, a German aristocrat who funded his trip to Vienna, where he, Beethoven came to study under Haydn, uh, and who introduced him to Viennese aristocracy, which helped Beethoven gain many of his most prestigious commissions later in life. And to thank Waldstein, Beethoven dedicated this piano sonata to him later in life. So we have this towering architecture, a very optimistic, almost sort of sacred space, which has been designed by the Dutch uh, architectural firm Tom Postma. Uh, they've completely transformed the galleries of the Kunsthistorisches, which are almost unrecognizable. There's a wonderfully unexpected pairing at the center of this gallery between a magnificent plaster sculpture by Auguste Rodin, made in 1877, his first life-size sculpture, which completely scandalized Parisian society when it was first uh, revealed. Um, it had the title at the time, The Vanquished. It's now known as the Age of Bronze. And it's a somewhat ambiguous figure uh, caught somewhere between triumph and defeat, suffering and glory. Uh, and it's almost a sort of stand-in for Beethoven himself here in the exhibition. A beautiful work borrowed from a museum in La Havre in France. And opposite, as a companion for this work by Rodin, we're showing a, a remarkable installation of a work, uh, a grand piano, suspended from the ceiling of our museum. It's a sculpture by the German artist Rebecca Horn, made in 1990. The title is Concert for Anarchy. Beethoven was a genius, but he was a genius who was also prone to explosions of rage and emotional anger. And we wanted to capture some of this uh, fiery temperament in the exhibition. If we have some luck, this work by Rebecca Horn will do something for us in a few minutes' time, or hopefully sooner, and will display a certain fiery nature. It's happening right now. This takes place around every 15 or 20 minutes in the course of the exhibition. When you're not expecting this as a visitor, it's a, it's a shocking moment, a discordant thump in the middle of this otherwise beautiful, serene gallery. So this is Rebecca Horn's Concert for Anarchy. And over here, almost as a bridge to the next gallery, we have a work by a British artist, Idris Khan. And for this work, which is a, a C-print photograph, Idris has photographed the title page of every single sonata by Beethoven and laid the photographs one on top of another, creating a wall of sound, or if you like, a void of sound. And the title, Struggling to Hear for Ludwig van Beethoven, is in reference to this terrible moment in Beethoven's life where at the age of 28, he began to realize that he was losing his most important sense, his hearing. And this dark moment in Beethoven's life is explored in the next gallery. So if you come with me, I can show that to you now.
So we're here now in the second gallery of the exhibition. It's dark, there's a completely different atmosphere. And what we're trying to evoke in this gallery, as I just mentioned, is this terrible chapter in Beethoven's life where he began to lose his hearing. And the objects that we've assembled include what looks like a wooden floor from any one of thousands of old apartments here in Vienna. But this isn't just any old wooden floor, it's the wooden floor from the room in which Ludwig van Beethoven died in the Schwarz Spanierstraße here in Vienna. When the building in which this apartment was found was torn down in 1903, a group of concerned citizens and Beethoven admirers preserved pretty much anything they could get their hands on from the apartment. The floor, doors, door frames. And since 1903, these wooden parquet panels have been piled up in the storage of a museum here in Vienna. And we were fortunate enough to be able to find them, uh, to restore them, and then to lay this floor in the exhibition uh, in this, here in the second gallery. And if you walk round the floor with me, We'll pass by some photographs taken in 1903 at exactly the moment before they began the demolition of this apartment. Uh, six empty, quite haunting photographs of the last resting place of Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven was famous for moving house, moving apartment very, very often. He's said to have had almost 67 apartments in Vienna. He changed his apartments like he changed his trousers, they say. Uh, I think it was due to a lot of problems with paying his rent that necessitated all of these moves. On the wall, as we move around the gallery, we have the famous Heiligenstädter Testament, a uh, deeply moving text written by Ludwig van Beethoven to his two brothers about this despair he felt at his physical decay. This text was found in his possessions uh, after his death. Uh, and was posthumously published. And over here on the wall, uh, on the other side of the gallery, as a companion to this floor, we have a series of etchings made by the great Spanish master Goya. Uh, Goya lived around the same time as Beethoven. He was born slightly earlier and died slightly earlier. And Goya himself was also deaf. And these prints, Los Caprichos, are a series of 80 prints, we have a selection of them on display here, in which Goya responds to this terrible hand that fate has played him. Here in this first print we see a, a tragedy of a love story. Beethoven himself was, was, was himself involved in a number of tragic love stories, always unrequited love. Uh, as we move down this wall of wonderful Goyas, will pass the, one of the famous ear trumpets used by Beethoven to help him absorb into his ear all of the peripheral sound that existed in a room and help him make sense of what was going on around him. Some of these are among the most famous images that Goya produced during his life, a work in which he satirizes the physician, the doctor, suggesting that the doctor's advice is so poor that it was in fact worse than sickness itself. And next to it, one of the most famous images that Goya produced during his entire life, a self-portrait, in which the artist is seen having a terrible dream which is filled with bats and asses and cats and all sorts of wild, haunting creatures. So this room is really about this dreadful moment in Beethoven's life, but things do take an upward turn, uh, and we'll see that as we move through to Gallery 3, if you'll follow me this way. We're here now in the third gallery of the exhibition, and it's really about the breakthrough that Beethoven made, having began to deal with this issue of not being able to hear. Um, 
it's known that Beethoven composed and wrote some of the most remarkable music after he could no longer hear. And many of these compositions were directly inspired by his encounters with nature. Beethoven was known for taking walks out into the forests, into the fields, where he took his notebooks and composed and wrote down thoughts. And in this gallery, we've got blue walls for the sky. We have a reflective floor with an almost water-like effect. We have landscapes. And we'll begin maybe in this little corner of the room where we've assembled a wonderful pairing of sketchbooks by the great British master Turner and some of Beethoven's own first impulsive compositions. It's been a dream of mine to exhibit sketchbooks by Turner in an exhibition for a very long time. We're showing some wonderful impulsive watercolor scenes of the south of England. This is a lighthouse close to Plymouth. We've got a sketchbook full of Turner's skies, studies of different cloud formations. And directly next to them, we have these first scratchy, uh, wild compositions of Beethoven. He was known for being particularly difficult to interpret in terms of how he wrote music. His copyists were always complaining that they couldn't make sense of what he was writing. And up here on the wall, we have four pages, four leaves from another sketchbook by Turner in which he portrayed a fire in the storehouse at the Tower of London. Uh, four different stages of the fire which he witnessed at first hand uh, in London. Then we'll gradually move over to another corner of the exhibition where we've assembled almost a small exhibition within an exhibition. We've gathered together seven remarkable paintings by the German master Caspar David Friedrich. Caspar David Friedrich is considered by many almost to be an old master now, but in a museum like this, he's still relatively modern. We've brought together seven paintings, a number of them from the Belvedere Museum here in Vienna, others from Munich and Hamburg and Weimar, some wonderful loans we were able to get. Friedrich and Beethoven did not know each other. We don't know of any correspondence between the two of them. But their ideas and their thoughts and their emotional rendering of the natural landscape are almost interchangeable, the same as Turner and Friedrich themselves. So this is a wonderful moment to enjoy paintings that otherwise you'd have to travel far and wide to be able to see. Sitting next to these paintings, we have a very special object in the exhibition, Beethoven's own personal copy of the Eroica Symphony Manuscript, which was commissioned by the Count Lobkowitz and first performed here in Vienna at the Palais Lobkowitz. You'll notice that it's dedicated in Beethoven's own hand to Napoleon Bonaparte, but famously this dedication was violently erased, scratched out by Beethoven after Bonaparte crowned himself as emperor. Beethoven fundamentally disagreed with this and therefore removed the dedication in the manuscript to Napoleon Bonaparte. Next door we have a wonderful loan of a painting from the Prado Museum in Madrid depicting Prometheus. Prometheus was uh, a mythical creature who defied Zeus by bringing fire from the sun to mankind, a liberator of mankind. And he's a figure with whom Beethoven himself was often compared and associated during his lifetime, a liberator of humanity. And next to this wonderful painting, we have the, the orchestral parts of the overture for the ballet Prometheus written uh, of course, by Ludwig van Beethoven and borrowed from the Lobkowitz collection in Prague, in the Czech Republic. Unfortunately, we cannot show you what is happening in the fourth and final gallery of the exhibition, the fourth movement of our symphony, if you like, and there's a good reason for that. Beethoven himself lived from wonderful commissions and he lived from live performances. So we felt it was incredibly important to have in our exhibition a moment of live performance and a moment of commission. 
So we invited a wonderful artist, Tino Segal, who lives and works in Berlin, to create a new work for the exhibition, which is a live performance which takes place every minute of every day of this exhibition until late January. He's working with a group of 10 wonderful singers and dancers who, together with Tino, have arranged a number of pieces of Beethoven's music for the human voice. Symphonies that are intended to be played by an entire orchestra are now being sung by a single individual. Gentle piano music, loud booming symphonies. For each different part of, of the music, a different part of the human body will dance. One piece of music has been arranged with movements for the face and the head, one for the shoulders, one for the feet, and for the Ninth Symphony, the entire body. So come visit the exhibition uh, whenever you have time. If you can't visit the exhibition, we hope that this walkthrough has at least given you a sense of what we've done here in Vienna. And now we have a chance to take a few questions from uh, all of you watching around the world. Thank you. ready to answer your questions. Thank you so much for sending them via email. Unfortunately, we heard that some of you had troubles posting your questions right next to the YouTube screen or couldn't see the chat. Maybe you want to switch to YouTube, to the YouTube mode, by clicking on the YouTube item at the very bottom of your screen if you are not on the YouTube page. But Jasper, let's start with the first question that we received from um, Manina. Hello, I was wondering which was the mechanism for which Beethoven could keep composing being deaf? <laughs> it's a very good question. Yeah. Um, you probably need to ask a doctor this or some sort of uh, cerebral uh, physician. Um, I think what is fortunate is that he had composed for so long during his life when he was able to hear that there was probably a certain relation between the notes and a certain vocabulary of, uh, of form and movement that had built up in his mind that enabled him to keep going. Um, it would almost be as if one of you or I lost our sight. We have a good enough grasp probably by our age. We're older than Beethoven was now when, when he lost his hearing. but by the age of 28, when the first signs began to, to come that he was losing. I assume he'd built up a large enough sort of almost musical repertoire. He'd listened to enough, he'd composed enough that he was able to keep going. But I, I, think, that's, I think that question is above my uh, pay grade, potentially, to give a, a, a really proper answer to. In any way, it's another proof of how much of a genius Absolutely. Beethoven certainly Absolutely, was. Yeah. Next question from Alvaro Soto from Spain, from Spanish television. First question, how does Beethoven's actual music blend into this exhibition before the live performance? So we are playing two different piano sonatas in the first gallery permanently. And when this piano spills out its keys, it, it literally attacks into the music that's playing in the gallery. So we hear Beethoven in the first gallery, there's deathly silence in the second gallery. We've created little sound tunnels to kill the sound as you move between them. And then in the third gallery, we're playing some of the late great symphonies that Beethoven composed after he lost his hearing. And then of course, in Tino Segal's gallery, you hear the music again. So in three of the galleries, you hear it. You also hear Beethoven's voice in each of the galleries through his words. In the first gallery, there's text projected. In the second, and here we have the text running around the very top of the gallery. So we hear his music and we, we can read his words, if you like. Add-on question, do you have something like an audio guide that we links to... We have an audio guide as well, exactly, which is, was done by all four of the curators walking around. Um, 
some of us spoke about some objects, some, some of the others, and we spoke about the idea of putting the exhibition together as well. The audio guide goes still in the third room, mm. in the final gallery, in the fourth room, because we didn't want people to be listening to it while they were also listening to the live performance. Great. Um, Vladimir from Moscow, Russia, is writing, may I know a little more about your initial general idea that you managed to realize this exhibition? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it happened uh, extremely quickly, I have to say. Normally for an exhibition this size, we would have around three years to prepare the exhibition. This exhibition we prepared in a single year. And this, as we know, can also be an advantage sometimes when you have to do something extremely quickly. There was tremendous momentum. I would say that the objects in this exhibition, including the wonderful icebreaker film, they came together extremely quickly. We chose the main objects for each of the galleries in about the first two weeks. We then had to secure the loans by contacting the museums or the artists and commissioning, which took a little bit longer. But the initial idea was an extremely intensive discussion that came together, I would say, very quickly. From what I've seen, I think architecture plays a very important role uh, for this exhibition, which is not a very usual approach for the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Maybe do you want to tell us a bit why is architecture so dominant during this, uh, this show? Yeah, we felt right from the beginning that we wanted to go beyond traditional exhibition design and look more into the world of theater and opera. And we actually invited around five or six different architectural firms to, uh, to pitch ideas for us. Uh, many of them are people who specialize in the world of theater and, and, and dance and so on. Uh, we ended up choosing this architectural firm from Amsterdam, Tom Posma. And what you actually see here in the exhibition is very, very close to their initial sketches and renderings. They nailed it right from the get-go, which is always a good sign uh, when the proposals come in. A very important question. Um, I think we haven't mentioned that from Jim Bayer from Toronto. Hello. How long will this exhibition be live? Very good question, uh, Jim. We will be live until, uh, I believe, the 24th of January. So hopefully some of the travel restrictions in place now will be lifted between now and then, and many of you around the world will have the chance to come to Vienna, see the exhibition, and also see everything else there is to enjoy here. I've got a very personal question for you from Joanna. Hello, Cespa. Great tour. Thank you very much. You mentioned that Turner next Beethoven was your long dream. Could you further explain? Joanna Art Safari from Bucharest. Hello. Yeah. And what was the brief for Segal? Ah, great, yeah. Uh, Johanna Turner, I, I suppose it's an English thing, but he's, he's one of my heroes. He's one of the architects of modern art. Um, one of the forefathers of abstraction. Uh, just someone I've always had huge respect for. I've always, uh, I've always been keen to, to have the opportunity to work, and especially the sketchbooks, because they are the most immediate, impulsive, heartfelt, emotional aspect of his work. They all belong to Tate Britain in London. They were part of his, the gift uh, from his estate to the British nation after he died. Um, the brief to Tino Segal was very simple. We would like to give you carte blanche to create a new work Uh, inspired by Ludwig van Beethoven. Tino has never created a commissioned work before. He tends to decline commissions. But when he read uh, my email inviting him, his reply was very interesting. He said, Beethoven is somewhere between Karl Marx and Jesus. He's a figure with whom we have to engage. So he took the challenge on and has created an absolutely remarkable work. So I hope you in Budapest, not too far away, you'll have the chance to come and see it. May we take with time for two more questions. One question is, would you say this exhibition is also suitable for Beethoven beginners? Or would you recommend reading a book or studying a bit of Beethoven before going to see the exhibition? It's my hope that the exhibition will actually, uh, there'll be something in here for, for, for most people. You can walk through the exhibition and simply know that Beethoven went deaf if that's all you know, which is all that a lot of people know, uh, you will 
learn something as you come through the exhibition. It's not an exhibition, a traditional exhibition, in the sense that we're attempting to communicate masses of information to people. We're attempting to communicate emotions and feelings. So actually the nicest way is to walk through the exhibition without me telling you anything and just walk through yourself. Uh, then perhaps you could go away and read something about Beethoven and then walk through again and it might be a completely different experience. But I hope that there will also be something in here for the real aficionados and we have a few of them in Vienna. And we've got a last question from Maria from Düsseldorf. She's writing, was Beethoven himself a lover of fine arts? Who was his favorite artist? It's a very good question, Maria. Um, we did quite a lot of research into this. Um, a lot of people have attempted to draw parallels between Beethoven and the fine arts, but there is not a lot known about Beethoven's <coughs> own taste. What we do know is that he was interested in classical art, antiquities. We thought briefly about bringing some of our antiquities collection here in the museum into the exhibition for this reason, but in the end we decided against it. But he's certainly not one of those artists who lived in museums and galleries at the time. And last question, Kata from Bucharest, or near Bucharest is writing, um, fantastic tour, thank you very much, Jesper. Um, and he wants to get a stream for posting it on various media and we're working on it. We are sending you a follow-up email and we're also sending you the links that you can maybe use for your own media. Well, so much for now. Thank you very much, Jesper. This was the first episode of Vienna Showcase. In case you liked it, we've got good news because we're already working on the second episode. It will be on Sigmund Freud, who just became a new museum in the 9th district, opened a couple of weeks ago, and we'll take you there in December. From all of us here, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe and goodbye from Vienna. <laughs>